registration. That session is going to be moderated by Mario Wotila from Finland, who is probably one of the she's rapidly in that same in that same group doing the thing she is doing in in Finland really taking the bull by the horns in in real life because she is a council member i believe uh in her town and contending with real life challenges at a level that few of us you know we're all in the architectural trenches but i don't i don't uh, envy the people who are in the in the civic trenches that's a whole other story so i'm going to stop this and um Let's, we have one more minute till we start. The poll is continuing um, for another few minutes. Uh, Mr. Cantor, uh, at when, uh, you know, in about uh, 10 minutes, can you put up a, a reminder with regard to the, uh, to the poll when you want to, when you want to uh, shut it down? Give people a one minute warning, please. Thank you. Okay. We're, I think we're somewhere close. Oh, we're a minute behind. Isn't that great? Mario, floor is yours and your groups. Thank you so much. Uh, can I just uh, make sure everybody's seeing my slides? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, wow, what a privilege. What a, how honored I am to be uh, chairing this next session titled uh, Recognizing Young Leadership, Meeting the Challenges of the 21st Century. And let me express my deepest gratitude of uh, being part of this whole event for the third time in my life right now. I think this is really a valuable, valuable gathering of like-minded people striving for the same better uh, future all, all over the globe. And being uh, on stage after, after the giants, after the... The people that were just uh, presented and who told about their uh, their struggles and their accomplishments against the modernism, I guess, pretty much, and how they've survived. I think that uh, this is also all about continuity, about taking the taking the uh, message and the wisdom of tradition to the next generations onwards and. I'm really happy and honored to present the next uh, speakers uh, who have not been um, speaking during this event yet. First of all, I must regret that we don't have Nadia Everard from La Table Ronde de l'Architecture with us tonight, nor Millie Main from Street Level Australia, nor Maria Sanchez from uh, or representing Kayala and the Guatemala City uh, plans. But they are in our hearts, and I think that they have been uh, on stage during the previous days of this event. So you have been uh, able to learn what they've been doing during the past years. About myself, I'm not an architect. And I've uh, started uh, in Finland. At, actually, this is the celebration day for me and the architectural uprising in Finland, because I founded uh, the architectural uprising Facebook group exactly eight years ago. <laughs> so this is, a, this is such a coincidence, but what a, what a lovely way to celebrate the, this, this, uh, this uh, anniversary for us. And the architectural uprising is all about civic engagement ordinary people who are whose thoughts are actually very much aligned with what what you guys have already been doing so this is a strong message from ordinary people that this is worthwhile this is all worthwhile and we are already more than uh 100,000 members in our nordic architectural uprising groups alone and we are expanding in different countries all the time and I think that the, the groups uh, or the networks that are presenting now are all also part of this these uh, civic engagement groups uh, that whatever bad things are said about social media 
it has brought us together much, much more and much more effectively than anything else before. So let's take, let's celebrate that as well. I'm also the, uh, the founder and chair of Intbau activities in Finland. I've been that, that uh, since uh, 2018. And this is all about having the same goals with the civic movement, but with professional uh, people engaged. We need both, of course. And further, we just published uh, a book, unfortunately only in Finnish, but striving for the same objectives as you guys here. It's called, in English, it's called Towards a More Beautiful City. In Finnish, Kohti Kauniin Pakaupunkia. And also, like Nira mentioned, I'm, because I've, in Finland, I've tried to find every possible way to promote better, more human, more beautiful, more trad traditional, more classical, new architecture and urbanism. So one path would be uh, going into politics. So I, I'm currently a member of the city council in my hometown, the city of Karina in Finland, and also currently the chair of the Urban Development Committee, which gives quite a lot of power over what's going on here. So, but that's that's for uh, for my part. And now I I hope I can change the uh, for our esteemed first panelist, who is uh, uh, Mr. Michael Diamant. And I'll give a short introduction uh, about Michael before I uh, give the floor to him himself. So uh, Michael Diamant is the founder of the social media page, New Traditional Architecture, that has helped to popularize the classical architecture tradition. Having studied society planning in Stockholm University, majoring in urban sociology, he felt the need for a channel to spread awareness that there is an option to the dominant modernist thinking in architecture and city planning. So new traditional architecture was, was founded in 2013 and has since inception spawned local groups that have successfully changed the public discussion about architecture in Scandinavia and beyond. A lot of attention is also given to networking and helping people discover like-minded people, both locally and internationally. Today, content from his social media pages can be found all over the internet, increasing interest for new traditional architecture and inspiring more to aspire to become classical architects. While much of his focus has been on content creation, Michael has increasingly been interviewed in media, post podcasts, and filmed interviews about his views on architecture and urban planning. But now I think, Michael, it's time for you to say something for yourself. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank, thank you very much, much for that introduction. And so I think we hear you twice. Is it, is it just for me or for everybody else? So there's some echo. I there's think an... someone may have their microphone on beside him. Now try again, please. OK, is there an echo now? Uh, no, the echo is still there. You still have another device open of some sort. I suggest, uh, are, we, are you gonna suggest log, log on, log off, uh, log off, log on, uh, Mr. Voroshk? Yeah, I would, I, would, I would suggest maybe we could um, quickly switch up the schedule in here for somebody else to tap in, for Mr. Diamant to uh, log off, log in, and then maybe it will work. That would be the... Hopefully, easiest solution. Okay, okay. I will. I will leave and join. join. All right, Michael. Could it be? Could it be something blocking the speaker? Something? Some object? No, I think that there are two programs open. Both of them using sound, of some sort. There's so, a feedback loop, it seems. So, Alejandro, since you are unmuted, now you're muted. You maybe like to step in? Hey, what, Mario, does that Ruben suit you? First. Oh, Ruben. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, okay, sure. so I'll introduce our next esteemed young leader, Ruben Hansen. Would that be okay? Thank you. Yes, yes. Please Excellent. continue. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. So 
I stop sharing Michael's presentation for now. Okay. And Ruben, you will be next and I'll give some introductory word, words for you. So we'll have Ruben Hansen. He is a founder of the Aesthetic City, a platform that promotes a more beautiful, livable, built environment through the production of content like videos and podcasts. The Aesthetic City has 30,000 followers on Twitter and its YouTube channel is growing rapidly as well. Ruben has a degree in urban planning at the University of Amsterdam and in urbanism from Delft University of Technology. Studies which he finished in 2017. He is the co-founder of the Utrecht Summer School of Traditional Architecture and Urbanism, Let's Build a Beautiful City. And here is Ruben, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Maria. I will quickly share my screen. Let me see, I have a little, can you see this? Perfect. Yeah, perfect. All right. So yeah, um, thank you so much. And uh, again, uh, really, really happy to be a part of this and to be able to present. I'll uh, try to keep it short. Um, so yeah, the Aesthetic City, uh, what do I do? What is it? Uh, let's have a short introduction. Yeah, so I'm first going to tell you a bit about who I am, what the Aesthetic City is, why I, why I founded it, and of course, some of the goals and the approach I use. So uh, yeah, I'm Ruben, uh, 32 years, currently living in Amsterdam. And uh, yeah, as Mario told, I have a bachelor in urban planning at the University of Amsterdam and in urbanism at the Delft engineering firm. But then I had the chance to uh, uh, end the inspiration to, to start something different because I saw how things were going and yeah, I, I wasn't really happy. So one of the things that made me really think about uh, what was happening uh, and how education was also lacking in in urbanism and, and just how the way we view urbanism and architecture in, yeah, in our uh, society for a large part is problematic because I was in, a, in this group and uh, we had to design, uh, redesign a park. And on the left, you see the park we were redesigning and you have this gray metal fence around it. And yeah, this, this whole area was a little bit problematic. And I believe that just by changing the fence, you would have such a great effect on just the whole morale of the people living around it and of the quality of the space around it, uh, because you have beautiful fences, as you see on the right, which uh, are, of course, classical. Um, but uh, they offer a bit of deed, more, more detail. They, they for something extra which Ruben you're breaking up I think it's uh your internet should me suggest now okay oh yeah uh, Can sorry you I, repeat uh, that? Where... yeah the so, last 30 seconds or so thank you yeah of course yeah just let me know if something happens again sure so I see that these the way we see sorry now I have to <laughs> kind of uh so yeah this during this experience in university, I saw like I, I got to experience how, uh, yeah, how problematic we uh, our whole relation is with with concepts like beauty and um, that it is not even considered and that people, uh, yeah, that, that it is that minimalism is kind of the de facto solution and doing something else is not even seen as in the realm of possibilities. So anyway, that was a kind of a learning experience for me, but it was also for me a, a kind of a signal in university to kind of shut up and just go along with. Okay, all, Ruben, all, you're breaking uh, yeah, up everything again. Everything needs to be. So uh, would yeah. you like okay. to do us a favor and maybe turn off your camera so... Yeah. Um, your server yeah. just has to process your voice yeah. just for the duration of your presentation. Yes, and of course. Just continue. Yeah. Thank you. Is this already better or uh, okay? Well, so one hundred percent better. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. So, what is the Aesthetic City? Um, it is a platform promoting a different approach to architecture and urbanism, and uh, I strongly believe in a holistic approach involving beauty, beauty and livability. You can't deconnect them; uh, they have to all be seen as the same thing. And I do believe that traditional and classical design can be used as tools and should not be forbidden uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> not be put in the toolkit which you can use. I think they should, they are very useful tools as well. So, how do I do this? Wait, is this the, yeah, 
I have a couple of channels. I have a Twitter channel with 30,000 followers now, um, a podcast with 26 episodes, which will grow in the coming time. Uh, in YouTube, uh, only two videos kind of, but 12,000 subscribers and growing. Uh, of course, a website and, uh, and an Instagram page. But the YouTube is now my main focus and uh, it has recently started surging. So that's a really good sign. So yeah, again, a little bit why the aesthetic city. During COVID-19, I was uh, working from home a lot and reading a lot about traditional architecture. And I discovered, yeah, after being very frustrated about the clinical way we handle cities and the, the stuff I got, I saw getting built, that, yeah, that there was actually an alternative and what well, yeah and this alternative you're breaking up again seem there, uh, there is an alternative I'm changing my internet right now Ruben can you repeat the last yeah. 15 seconds or so yeah you're breaking up again I'm yeah. very sorry uh, okay yeah so I'm just going to return to this one. So uh, real, quick, real quick, uh, Ruben, the, Ruben, I'm going to interject here. Yeah. Ruben, can you get closer to your yeah. Wi-Fi router or can you place an Ethernet line straight into your computer? We will probably have the same issue. Is it possible to do either? I'm going to find the the internet connection first because i am in a, an apartment somewhere i'm actually on a trip so i can't let me see where that audio sounds great this is if, better if possible ruben to find the router and place the router next to your computer without any yeah, metal I'm... or objects between the router and your computer I'm in a, in a holiday home. I have no idea where the router is. So <laughs> it's a little bit uh, tricky. But this um, sounds great as of now. Yeah. This sounds better? Way better. Okay. For now, I'm just going to sit here for now. Okay. Please continue. Yes. So um, during COVID-19, I was reading a lot about traditional architecture and urbanism and um, uh, at the same time, I was getting frustrated about the clinical, the gold and the stark designs, which we saw everywhere, uh, and the increasing ugliness and the messiness, but also the lack of vision. And this lack of vision is one thing we now see in the Netherlands. We have a massive housing shortage. And then you get professors in urban development saying, like, well, don't bother building a new city. It will be a blank place anyway. Uh, just let's build massive new suburbs near existing cities. They just assume that you can't build a nice, vibrant city and I strongly disagree so yeah in 2021 uh, I had this personal paradigm shift and I believe that there actually is a real alternative and that is using these well traditional architecture the traditional urbanism um, and these principles which are time proven and uh, that they, these actually are being used and that they are provably better and uh, the only reason that we don't build like that is because outdated ideas and widespread policies. So that's a bit of the why. And yeah, uh, although I'm not really as much as an expert, uh, I try to communicate the knowledge that already exists because there is a lot of knowledge, only it's not being distributed well enough yet, uh, yeah, in my opinion. So um, yeah, I try to leverage knowledge of cities, traditional design principles in media production and create a platform to spread that to a wider audience. So my hope is just by uh, yeah the actions of one little fish, you can get a big school fish to uh, get along and slowly but surely change the course of this oil tanker, which is the direction our cities are being developed right now. So um, yeah, the goal is to change the narrative and uh, to go towards a narrative focused on beauty, well-being and harmony and cherishing unique local identities and culture which is now completely overlooked in my opinion. And how to do this is, well, uh, as I described through all these multimedia products. So we have the website, we have the Twitter account, where I post most images, short analysis, the podcast available on all major platforms. Um, and of course, uh, yeah, with a lot of interesting guests with Robert Adam, for example, uh, Dr. Buras, uh, Michael Diamant, a lot of uh, interesting uh, guests 
and now the YouTube channel where I am uh, focusing on mostly now with 12,000 subscribers already and uh, growing really rapidly at this moment. And it's mostly it is about important themes in this field and busting myths of like it's too expensive, it's not possible, it's not of our time, uh, and many more, of course. So yeah, who watches these videos? Well, apparently uh, a lot of people are really resonating with this kind of uh, uh, topics because uh, I've seen incredible growth the last few uh, uh, days, actually. And um, there's a lot of videos being made about this topic, subject right now. So I think this is just the beginning. Uh, the first video is about beauty and what it kind of is about. 14 minutes long and uh, already 55,000 views and growing. And then the second video is about Lipless Eagleman Zone. Also, yeah, to show this project to a wide audience and 180,000 views and rising rapidly. So some goals, uh, expand the team, go to more and more subscribers, and hopefully one day set this new narrative about how we should uh, build uh, towards a more democratic process involving, involving more people. And of course, uh, yeah, valuing beauty and harmony instead of contrast, chaos, and just originality for originality's sake. So uh, yeah, with this, I hope to get this butterfly effect started. And um, yeah, for more information, just uh, feel free to send a mail or contact me any way you like. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. And my very, very strong recommendations for any of you who hasn't yet connected with the Aesthetic City uh, on the different platforms that it exists, please do whatever is convenient for you, YouTube or, or Instagram or uh, any of the podcast uh, environments or, or Facebook or anything, please connect. And also please share. This is all about sharing. I think that uh, sharing the information, sharing the content that somebody's put their heart into uh, is really a valuable, valuable thing because we can't do an, everything by ourselves. So we have to lean on those who have the talent and who have been able to create such such valuable content as as Ruben was describing here. So please do please connect with the aesthetic city. And now I think that we have Michael back. And I, I give the floor to you. Please tell me, tell us about your work, Michael. Let's see if the microphone works first. Is there Perfectly. an echo? Perfectly. Very nice. Very good. Wonderful. Wonderful. And also perfect. perfect. Okay. Uh, could you share my presentation, Mario? I'm doing my best. Mm -hmm. You're doing excellent. Well, uh, I would first, of course, like to thank you, you know, for receiving the recognition and youth leadership. I'm 41 years old, so it's wonderful to be still recognized as youth. Uh, and I would also like to thank, you know, the organizers tag. Uh, I've tried to follow as much as possible now the three last days, and it has been very, very interesting as always. And it's a great new yearly initiative that will only get even better, you know, for, for every day, for every year. I would like to talk not about so much about, you know, the, the sites that I, that I organized, new traditional architecture, or, or the different directories that I've created, but about city planning and some thoughts, uh, because if it's you know if in, if architecture is in a bad state in in general now, city planning is in even worse days, and it's much easier to replace a building a bad building than to redraw an entire street grid, and it is quite easy now also to find you know a, a quite good a decent new traditional building, but it's very very rare to find new good urbanist projects, at least to my, in my opinion. So I would like to point out a few things when building new city districts and finally show uh, an example that I think does most things right. And maybe I'm already hitting, you know, an, an open door. Maybe people, you know, planners consider these things, but I'm not that sure about it, you know, when I see the end results. So if you change slide, Mario. Yeah. Yeah. So here is one thing that I see all too often is the lack of cohesiveness in urban. Uh, new built 
uh, neighborhood should always be you know wall to wall with all neighborhoods and one should not notice when one crossed the line between them between them just as it was before all too often when i see new urbanist projects they are islands disconnected from the old urbanism and they are even divided into disparate parts within the same project so this result you in, in bedroom communities with some chain store shops but not new urbanity all the things you know unique and interesting in a city cannot survive in this type of atomized urban environment the cohesiveness makes more street urban mixed use and they spread out people more in the urban fabric instead of a main street and this is good for shops that can't afford to be on, on prime locations to mention a few advantages so so cohesiveness something i really think one should consider when, when planning you the second thing that i see in many new urbanist projects and many projects in general when it comes to city building is that they don't they fail to take consideration of barriers and what is a barrier a barrier can is more than often a road a heavy traffic road or a railroad so here you can see an example of a popular new urbanist development in in sweden where i live it's called jakriborg and on one side you have a modernist built-up town of called Järup, and on the other side of the railroad you have this new urbanist development because, but because it is so hard to get to this new urbanist development, it has become a bedroom community. There is no life in it. Stores cannot run. The, even the, you know, the regular food store is struggling to survive just because it's so hard for people from Europe to just walk to the other side. And this is something one should have had in consideration when planning this area, but one hadn't. And one still, you know, more than 20 years after this development started, haven't fixed, you know, proper passages for people to easily walk to this new urban area. But this, this example of Europe is, is uh, and Yakribor is not alone. You know, I've seen in many, many projects, you know, where there are effective barriers closing, you know, making, making new areas that could be successful. They don't work simply because people cannot easily access them. Another thing that I don't see that much now is the use of sight lines. You know, city planning used to enhance the beauty of our built environment. And city planners in the past, they regularly used this technique with sight lines, which created imposing views as well as ease of orientation. You know, a sight line is basically you have the street and it ends up in a magnificent building. So it also makes it easier for the mind. We've been talking a lot about, you know, neuroscience uh, in, in this tag and in previous tags, because the street gets a natural end and it doesn't create the impression of it, it being an endless street. So this is a, a very beautiful technique that I rarely, rarely ever see in, in new urbanist projects. Then, of course, we have the art of grid making. This can be a, a critique of some sort, but I see too much of, of uh, lack of a better word, medievalism, uh, when it comes to new urbanism, and, and not grids that can be scaled, scaled to a city of millions. You know, and on this picture, you can see Budapest. Uh, while you don't need to have the most rigid of grids, rigid, you know, raster grid, like many new world grids, straight streets and, and boulevards are essential for, for a good flow in a large city it's one thing with a you know a, a district of 5000 but we should have the you know the planning goal of, of planning for for cities of millions or hundreds of thousands then uh, i'm very much a, a courtyard urbanism i believe that you know courtyard urbanism is is really really the greatest uh, and it's important to create private spaces for neighbors only. Uh, it's not that each family needs a private plot, uh, but you know you could have a shared courtyard that is closed and private only for you know the people that live in the building surrounding the courtyard. So if you design a courtyard, it should be closed. This is, of course, more a problem, you know, in, in, in modernist new planned areas that they always keep the courtyards open. But I've seen it always also in, in urbanist and, and 
you know, if you don't close the courtyard, you create no man's lands, which destroy the purpose of the courtyard. And that is that it should be private and safe space for neighbors, you know, in, in the bustling city, they're private where they get to know each other. And finally then, uh, to just show an example of all that I mean, I would like to show a project that is in Berlin called Revale Spitze. No project is perfect, but I think that this project does very much more right than wrong. And the type of urban urbanity here is, of course, you know, the continental European, more like central European courtyard urbanism. So this area, as you can see, is completely new. I hope it's quite easy to, to see which, which of the which of the quarters that are new. And the built up area is wall to wall with the old. So there is no border, there is no landscape in between. It's wall to wall with the old. It follows the same grid, more or less, the same street width, and buildings have the same height as adjacent buildings. Each plot contains many buildings with a large closed green courtyard. And these courtyards, they are larger than the traditional ones because you don't have buildings in the courtyard that you have in many of the older courtyards. So what you have is a perfect private green island, you know, and it's sound protected, which is also very important in the city. And, and I think this model is very, very attractive for people, uh, especially to have a kids, to have a large green courtyard where you can just safely let your children play. The area is, of course, mixed use, uh, maybe not as heavily as the more central district, but it's still mixed use. And uh, they also used another technique that I love. Uh, if you scroll back to the previous, previous slide, you can see that this whole new area is next to a railroad. And of course, there will be a lot of noise. So the solution here has to be like a wall, an office wall. So these buildings next to the railroad are offices. So in that way, they protect the interior of the neighborhood from a lot of noise. So yeah, they really thought about a lot of, lot of things in this. So, so in conclusion, this is very much a natural continuation of the city. And this is something that we should strive for, not, not separate islands, but just build on the existing urban fabric and just expand it naturally like, like we did before. That was all I had to say, just a, a small presentation that is not focused on, on what I do with new traditional architecture, but just some, some insights about city planning that I, I don't see that much in, in the many projects that I review every time. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much, Michael, for, for your insights. And also, I'd like to invite everybody to follow and join your platforms. Most of them are called New Traditional Architecture, aren't they? Yes. Yes, they are. So it's on Facebook. It's not on Instagram. Uh, there is a blog page where you have an atlas, like a Google Maps layer, where you can find new projects in every country. And then there's that's, called, you... that's, that's called New Traditional Atlas. Yeah, the Atlas of New Traditional Architecture. You yeah. can find the link of it to the in the blog page. And then, of course, you can find me on Twitter. On Twitter, I, I post on my own name, uh, Mikkel Diamant. But it's more or less, the advocacy is more or less the same everywhere, to show different projects from different parts of the world and will link to the architect that made them. Uh, so easy, you know, the way to discover architects in, in many of the non-English speaking countries. That's such, such valuable content that, that you're making. And also I suggest all of, all of us who are present in this uh, event now connect with Michael's uh, work and also share as much as possible because that's that's huge job that Michael's been doing during the past years and still going strong, of course. Yeah. I, think that, I think that we can take some comments in the end, but do I understand correctly, Mr. Salingaros, that you would have an immediate uh, comment or question to Michael? Then I'd like to ask you to... Uh, ask thank you, Mario. Uh, uh, Michael uh, raised some very interesting points about important design criteria that are sometimes ignored. Well, uh, let me uh, recall to everyone the pattern language that has exactly this sort of these sort of criteria like the, um, uh, the, the orientation, the courtyards, 
Uh, these were practical uh, design rules that were discovered by Alexander and his associates. So there are two books, the pattern language, which contains 238 patterns, and the new pattern language, which was is published by my friend Michael Mahaffey. So those contain exactly the little tidbits of information that you complained that are missing. I just wanted to make that, that point. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, what a valuable insight in, in this conversation. Now I'd like to introduce you uh, Last uh, panelist, last speaker, Mr. Alejandro Garcia Hermida. He's an architect and a professor of the practice at the School of Architecture of the Polytechnic University of Madrid. He holds an MA and a PhD in heritage preservation and has been visiting scholar at the Notre Dame School of Architecture. His professional practice has been focused on traditional architecture and the restoration and study of historic buildings. He is the executive director of the INPAO initiatives in Spain and Portugal, the CEO of Calam US, and a member of the board of the nonprofit Terra Chilia. His work has been awarded by Hispania Nostra, Europa Nostra, the Philip Rothier Foundation, and the Spanish government. So please join us, Alejandro, and give your presentation, your valuable insights. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Mario, and for moderating this session. And thank you, Nir, for inviting me to this very interesting event and to all the speakers for your contributions, especially to you, Ruben, and, and Michael, and Mario, for, for this very, very interesting initiative you are managing in order to open our group to a wider world. I think this is... Um, it, it is fantastic to see in person so many people and, and learn from so many people at the same time. I, well, the same as the rest of, of the speakers, I will just very, really share some thoughts and some notes on what we are doing through this presentation. Uh, can you see it? Yes, perfect. Uh, is it now full screen? Well, I brought... Uh, I'll change the scale, let's say, and I, I'll go to like a detail. Um, because we were discussing previously, Mario and I, we were talking by phone and we were talking about what's beauty, um, what's beautiful and how it relates to qualities that are shared uh, and appreciated by most of the people. And I think one of the things that is most interesting in, in beauty is that there are many things that just because they seem natural, durable, they seem familiar, we like them. And we like them even when they are deteriorated and when they are even vanishing already. And I brought this data, which is from a roof, which is place specific as most roofs are because tiles are normally very local in their shape and size. And it's from Segovia in central Spain. And it's a very old house, which is already, as you can see, it's abandoned, but it, this picture for me it, it's a way to see how traditional architecture meet, meet one of the goals that we have set for us for the future which is uh, precisely about being more sustainable more durable more uh, engaged in the public all these things and here you can see how nature somehow uh, takes back what it was natural material before one thing that we work very much with from the initiatives I'm, I'm working on is precisely on how we transform those materials today into architectural shapes and, and how to um, help with giving continuity to the knowledge to do it properly so we can keep achieving those goals. These are the hands of Luis Prieto, who is a fantastic uh, stucoist. He's a uh, very good doing escayola and cochopesto and all these kind of, of techniques. What he does is done uh, forever, as far as it, it is taken care. And most of the educational initiatives that we put together have to do with that. Uh, this is from our workshops in Morocco, where we basically try to share those qualities and and try to to um make them obvious to more people while 
basically practicing building and doing architecture for some days, like building it and seeing how small decisions uh, have a, a very important role in which uh, we will be considered beautiful afterwards and into adding beauty to a place and not just a pile of uh, materials which in the future will be rubbish and will just be contaminating the place. I think this is, I'm going like very idealistic with that. And obviously in our practice, we can never reach a hundred percent what we would love to see as beautiful architecture. And I think this is one of the topics also, which would be interesting to address, which is why it is so difficult to practice traditional architecture today and, get, and achieve the goals we set. And the, there's a, there's a, the situation nowadays for us is that we, we try to be traditional and we don't get it fully. And, and in everything that we have to uh, give up, tradition is precisely in what, in what we are being less sustainable. And this is totally related. Like, yeah. And shows how much tradition can guide us to achieve all those other things that we have set as goals for our 21st century. Um, and I brought, I wanted to bring also this uh, picture from one of uh, Donald Gray's New Towns in Southern Spain. We recently published a book with uh, Oro Editions. It's named The Most Beautiful Neighborhoods of Andalusia. Uh, on the work on Donald Gray, on the work of, of this uh, fantastic architect. And for me, uh, this street shows very well uh, what I was describing uh, turned into architectural form and urban space. It goes in, from the little detail to the whole, and it has this continuity with the place, which uh, we would all, I think, share as an ideal with the place and with the, the materials of the place and the culture of the place and the, not only like the physical aspect of the place, but also with the things that everyone would recognize as, as culturally fitting in that place. This has been already presented uh, by Carolina uh, Cabra, uh, our Directory of Traditional Building Masters. But I, I use this time also to remind you that you can use this tool we have just uh, uh, created that, like uh, we have changed the design now. We are testing some, uh, fixing some errors in the new design, but it's already working and you can use it. And it's uh, open to you to look for the best people practicing these uh, traditional building trades today in Spain. Uh, this is a picture from one of the exhibitions that we organize. And so we yearly try to um, identify who is doing the good work and try to get as many people as possible to know that they are still doing that good work. Because many times one of the answers you receive when you say, I want to do this uh, traditionally, is that that cannot be done. That's not done anymore. I'm very and sorry suddenly, to interrupt, Alejandro. This is yeah. just the 10 minute warning before the keynote is supposed to start, just FYI. Okay. Yeah, so we are, be... wrapping, we are wrapping up in a minute. I'll be quick. No I'll be quick just for your information. Okay. Um... So when when you are told that, the, the funny thing is that actually there are, there's a lot of people doing that. And, and if they don't have more work, it's actually because they are being denied. People are saying they don't exist, but they exist. And happily, we are, we are, st we are about to lose them, but we still have them in most places. Uh, there are places where it's where it's easier and places where it's already very complicated to find them, but they are still there. And also architects who work with them. And in order to promote those models, we created also this journal. These are the first and second issue, but we are now working on the fourth. Please take a look at it if you don't know it yet. It's traditionalarchitecturejournal.com. And also we have some YouTube channels full of uh, lectures on these topics by uh, architects, uh, masters in different building trades, 
uh, also people managing different initiatives related to education on these fields or uh, promotion of, of of this from the administration and trying also to to teach or introduce to these topics to students worldwide uh, through uh, different activities and I didn't I wanted also to to uh, let you know that we are already accepting applications for our next summer school uh, which this time which this time will take place in Barcelona for the first time we are we will welcome applications from everywhere so you have friends or or students or people who might be interested in in applying for it we have a very limited amount of, of places for the number of applications we used to receive but uh, everyone is welcome and we try to form a group as varied as possible always so well thank you this is this would be all thank you thank you Alejandro so much I have to uh, wrap up this session uh, unless you've already done so please uh, connect with INTBO initiatives uh, all over the world and also these uh, very important INTBO summer schools uh, that are organized by uh, by uh, Alejandro and uh, um, the colleagues in Spain and Portugal. And also uh, next summer, there will be uh, in Bau summer schools in the Netherlands and in Belgium, at least in these places, probably in more places, but, but please stay tuned. And education is one of the key elements here. I'll, I'd like to wrap up this session by saying that also for the future, we need to change some regulations in different countries uh, that are hindering the new coming of traditional and classical architecture. Education is, of course, the key element. Also, we need to identify and promote uh, the successful good models and benchmarks. Also, we have to uh, bring humanism, understanding human behavior back to the agenda. Also, uh, the original green sustainability is integrated in uh, traditional and classical architecture. So that's something that uh, is already in our, and also like we've heard in this session, publicity, uh, social media platforms, those are the powerful tools for our message today and tomorrow. But let me thank you all for being here for this session and uh, I'll wrap up. And also uh, I'm really looking forward to the next presentation by, by Professor Rubczynski. And, and I'm, uh, I hope that we haven't taken too much time from this esteemed presentation. But thank you on, on my behalf as well. Thank you so much for being on target here. This is really very nice of you here, Professor Rybczynski. Uh, meanwhile, uh, fill out the forms for your CEUs and, and, uh, and um, certificates um, and questions. Um, do we have any questions here? So I didn't really got any direct questions to the presentation. There was some discussion going on, but not like really direct questions. So I think that uh, any comments and questions can continue in the chat if needed. And also and everybody in the out. chat seems to be uh, very, very happy with the work you do. And uh, just to let you guys know that. Thank you. Construction is a very, very, is a very, very conservative uh, field. In the 1980s, you could not get a window wall. You actually had to design the sections yourself. You could still get, get a two-story high freestanding masonry wall if you needed. Today, you can't find someone to put two bricks one on top of each other. But everybody and his brother is producing a window wall system. It's a matter of fashion. It's fashion and construction. Construction was always subject to fashion. What else is new? So now the fashion is all this technological shit. Sorry, stuff, excuse me, please. And it's there, it's what we have. Uh, so it's gonna take a while to turn this huge ship around. The 
the option is simply to continue doing what we're doing. And the other stuff, you know, in, in transportation technology, the big contribution of the 20th century was the jet engine. The two big contributions were the jet engine and the cup holder. Everything else already existed in the 19th century. And even the seat pocket existed in the, in the, uh, seven, in the 18th century, 17th century in stagecoaches. So when you're talking about technology, you're talking about anything that has to do with the built environment. It takes a while for things to, to come around. It, it took a while for the, uh, for the arch to, to happen and so on and so forth. But the beauty business, it, it, it spread like wildfire very, very quickly. I think that it's a good idea. Somebody asked here about basic books, uh, 10 classics. Um, I think everybody knows what those books might be. There are a lot more than uh, the Christopher Alexander method out there. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want to really know how to build something well, you can uh, start from Palladio or even Alberti. They actually document construction methods that are extremely durable. Uh, so there's nothing ancient about them and they're not books for pictures. Yes, uh, Nikos. Yes, yes. Uh, I only responded to uh, the two books that I recommended in, in my comment. I would not recommend Palladio or Vitruvius. I would recommend Nir Bura's classic planning, a totally up-to-date, hyper-modern treatise that's, that's much better than all the old classics. This is my prejudice. Everyone look at Nir Bura's book. And of course, Leon Kriya's book. There are, there are about a dozen excellent texts. My point was that these are not uh, referred to in architects as well. What, what we're actually looking for at the, thank you very much for saying that. Um, we, what can I say? We tried to, we worked very hard at all this stuff, but, but I think that there's probably, if you look at the total, and I think Andres knows this as well as anybody else, or better than anybody else. If you look at the total number of worthwhile books that actually make a difference, they're not just, you know, navel gazing and, and jibber jabber of the, the traditional methods out there, books of the last since forever that are really the necessary basic books in architecture and urbanism. I wonder if there are, I wonder if there are a hundred. I know for sure they're probably not a thousand. And I, I am looking for that list. So with that, with that desire, I am handing over the uh, podium to Professor Witold Rybczynski, who has published this absolutely marvelous book on the story of architecture. And I suspect that like everybody else who...